Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Radhika Buyan will defend her academic thesis, Firm Innovation Strategies in Alternative Energy Systems. The subtitle of the dissertation is Exploring the Dynamics of Firm Innovation Strategies over the Technology Lifecycle. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, friends, family, and highly esteemed opponents and members of the corona, and those that are viewing in from across the world. So this PhD thesis research had explored renewable energy systems and how firms strategize around innovation. So as we all know that there is an increasing role of the role increasing recognition of the role of alternative energies and the need for all of us to move towards low carbon and uh, carbon efficient, cost effective uh, carbon uh, ca energy technologies. Now these, are, these alternative energy technologies, they are actually responding to the emerging challenges of basically the 21st century, like climate change and also related to energy around energy security and access to energy. And alternative energy systems, they're actually becoming important not only in developed countries, but in developing countries as well. So my thesis, I analyzed three alternative energy technologies. One is uh, the hydrogen fuel cells that's uh, applied to automobiles and solar PV technologies and wind energy technologies. And uh, so these uh, alternative energy industries, they are actually modern industries. So when analyzing modern industries such as these alternative energy systems, there's a need, especially for innovation and technology studies, to develop new analytical frameworks. And so we developed one such to understand how technology influences firm strategy in an industry. So the research question is, how is technology impacting firm innovation strategies and what kind of dynamical changes is causing ch causing changes within the alternative energy industry. So we analyze the link between industry, technology, and firm strategic choices, that is firm innovation strategy. And so the link still requires a better understanding. So we do this by exploring this interrelationships at this three level, the firm, the industry, and technology. And these, they dynamically interact to actually drive evolution in the industry. So although influences between firms and technology, they are bi-directional, that is, technology impacts firms, and firms can impact te technical change. But this research is looking at the unidirectional influence of technology on firm strategy. So the first chapter, it started, we looked into the dynamics of the alternative energy systems and to try and understand what factors have caused such systems to change. So we did a historical analysis and we divided into four different periods. And the beginning of the analysis was traced starting from the 1970s, and I'll share in the next slide why, and up to uh, the 2000s. So we, in each of these uh, periods, we actually observe the role of firms in each of these periods. And firms are one of the main drivers of the system. They interact with in institutional factors, such as policies, and then components of the system, such as technology. So in the first period, for example, we saw the type of firms that actually entered the alternative energy system. Uh, and these technologies, some of the examples of the firms that entered in the 1970s were solar PV, they were startups, but basically spin offs from space applications. And there were large electronics and semiconductor firms, obviously, oil and gas firms. And in the 90s to 2000s, we did see an entry of flat screen manufacturers, laser CD manufacturers, and glass manufacturers. So this shows that modern technologies are actually increasingly combinatorial, which means that alternative energy technologies, they're based on the science and technology base of older industries. And therefore, the production and development of these energy technologies, they combine the knowledge and skills base of the older technologies. For example, I can give you an example where the skills and the knowledge base 
uh, the, the manufacturing processes of laser CD and glass manufacturers they use for solar PV manufacturing. So this points to the need for cross-industry collaborations between firms. And uh, this uh, graph is essentially to show the development of alternative energy technologies, or re renewable energies, they actually follow the highs and lows of oil prices. And then this is a graph, but I highlighted the peaks in the oil prices. And for example, between 1980, mid-1980 and mid-1990s in the graph, there was a dwindling interest in alternatives. That was when oil prices had stabilized. And actually during this phase, lobbying by oil and gas companies and automobile firms, they were actually reducing all the emissions criteria. And, and in the mid 1990s and 2000s, it was also characterized by a very serious focus on climate change and any energy security concerns because they, it, it was going through one of the biggest oil price shocks. So these kind of factors that forces economies to re-strategize their energy consumption patterns this, then they start seeking alternatives in non-fossil energy, such as renewables and other energy efficient technologies. And so what causes uh, these such dynamical changes in alternative energy systems? Uh, what we saw is that in this period, as I explained earlier, there was a combinatorial nature of technologies. And then we saw a change in the number of firms entering and exiting the industries. There was a play between large and small firms. There was obviously the participations of firms from across sectors. There were experimentation with new technologies and there were introduction of new regulatory policies and pressures. So this chapter two, it fo create, uh, would focus on looking at um, uh, theories. It created a framework combining the technology life cycle with uh, the um, innovation strategies of firms. So industries are sequentially map in a phase of emergence, then there's growth and there's maturity, which forms eventually, I'll show in the next uh, slide, that it shows, uh, it forms a S-shaped evolutionary pattern. So there are three distinct stages of technological development here, nascent growth, maturity, and each stage is represented in my study with hydrogen fuel cells in the first stage because it's a nascent and an emerging technology. Solar PV, which is in the growth space, uh, growth phase, and the wind en energy technology, which is in the mature phase. So the TLC the, uh, combining the S-curve with uh, yeah, innovation strategies. So in the first phase, these are the characteristics of uh, the different stages of technology in the different phases of growth. And so some of the, the obviously in the beginning stages, there's a lot of technological uncertainty, including market uncertainty and markets are fragmented. And later on, I go on to show how in the early stage, there is a preference for innovation strategies, such as licensing agreements and joint ventures. And when you come to a mature stage, there's a high degree of technological certainty. And there's a, in the first stage, there's an entry of a lot of small firms. And then eventually they exit in the growth phase. And, uh, and the, in the third phase, there are few large firms. And then there is uh, the emergence of a dominant design. And in the early phases, the design, the dominant design isn't really there. There would be many competing technologies of, at, at, the, at the same, uh, of the same technology at the, but the dominant designs, there would be different, um, let's say technologies. Um, uh, yeah. So the day, uh, so there's a patent. I, uh, these were the patents granted. Just, just to show how in the early phases of, uh, like for hydrogen fuel cells, there's a high rate of patents that are granted. And, and in the later phases, the patents decline. And that's how we kind of, this conforms to the stage, technology life cycle stage criteria. And the data that we collected were firm data on innovation strategies, such as joint ventures, licensing agreements, and mergers and uh, acquisitions. 
and we collected it from news clippings and company uh, postings on the internet by firms and news analysts that we collected it by ourselves because at that time during the start of this thesis we could not find information through the regular database on such strategic alliances uh, and mergers and acquisitions such as the Catty Merit database and the Thomson and Reuters database. And is at, at that time as well, the alternative energy market was not classified as a separate industry, and it's uh, which, that we could have used a separate SIC code. And eventually in 20, 2009, we got data from the New Energy Finance that published the results of the database on only m &A activities on solar and wind. So chapter three, the empirical chapter, it dealt with the results of the study of this study confirms that when a technology matures, firms are more willing to commit to the, to the industry. And when technology is immature or nascent, firms are less willing to invest in flexible and more integrated forms of external sources of information, of innovation like mergers and acquisitions. And in chapter four, that is also an empirical um, chapter, and this thesis had observed that over the technology life cycles, large and small firms, they responded differently, both to enter and compete in the, in the industry. And the last chapter, had the empirical chapter, the fifth one, looked at innovation strategies of firms with universities and research organizations. And we used a web of science publication data to use it as a proxy for research and development collaborations between firms and research organizations and universities. So it was observed that the number of partnerships with universities and research organizations is actually higher in the second, in the second stage of the technology life cycle than the first, and research and development in the third stage is very uncommon in the third, in the third stage. And it's concentrated mainly, if there are any partnerships, it's concentrated mainly around testing and certifications of standards and quality. So the major findings, one of the major findings of this study is that interactions are observed to emerge at three di distinct levels, the level of the firm, the technology, and the industry. So it has been hypothesized in the industry, in the industry life cycle literature and which corroborates with the Schumpeterian view that technology creates change. It alters the conditions under which firms compete. It changes the relative positions in the industry. It changes the structure and causes entries and exits. And it also determines firm strategic behavior to innovate. And around theoretical and empirical findings, uh, relatively little is known about the interaction between industry life cycle and firm strategy and especially in this industry, and therefore this research, it actually support, which is supported by empirics, contributes to the gap in the literature. And the study collaborate, contributes in elaborating our understanding of the link between firm strategies and technology. And furthermore, the role that technology plays in influencing the evolution and the direction of an industry. So there is, in terms of methodological, in, uh, in terms of policy, policy frameworks, they are mainly focused on, predominantly on promoting the use of alternative energy or renewable energy technologies by introducing very complex framework conditions such as CDM and carbon trading mechanisms. However, many countries, especially the de developing countries, they may not often have the capacity to develop the energy technologies on their own. And because of the advanced stage of the technology, of the, of the technology partnerships with firms should be encouraged, especially to, so that other countries can access new energy technologies and the technical know-hows that's already been developed. And this study has contributed to research by sh also showing the engagement of uh, large and small firms. And sometimes they act as rivals, but sometimes they are as, as complementary. And each, they bring in different advantages and resources to each stage of the technology life cycle. And eventually, they influence the curve along which the industry evolves. So in terms of uh, future research, because of the relative newness, I wouldn't really, at that time especially, uh, of this study, we could not append the database with information on R&D expenditure of firms 
uh, or, uh, belonging to the alternative in the alternative energy sector. And they, we checked the R&D scoreboard, and which only reported R&D expenditure of firms which exceeded only a particular limit. And only around, we found only three alternative energy firms that appeared in the R&D scoreboard back in 2008. So we believe that access to data on internal R&D, one could do more robust analysis on the uh, choice of an innovation strategy by firms. And the other, uh, a longi uh, would have been good to have a longitudinal database, which could give us a better insight on the evolution of these partnerships uh, with regard to only one of these technologies. We could have uh, this over one technology, the firms that played starting from inception to maturity over maybe a span of 20 years for each technology. And we think that especially in chapter five, which was related to firm innovation strategies with regard to uh, universities and public research organizations, that this can itself be a whole research project itself uh, in understanding the link further the industry and university, which is crucial to advancing research on alternative energy technologies. And, yeah. and I think one could gain more insight through surveys, case studies, and pattern studies, understanding these partnerships, including uh, the amount of R&D expenditure. And, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. Luc Sutter, who is a professor of international economic relations at Maastricht University, and in particular at UNU Merit. And he was also the chair of the assessment uh, committee. The floor goes to Professor Sutter. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, I've read you your thesis with great interest. Let me first of all congratulate you on the timing of your defense. While the Sharm el Sheikh Climate Change Conference, the COP27, is taking place, we can discuss here in Maastricht the real issues with some of your more fundamental insights involving firms' innovation strategies and how they change over the product life cycle in the particularly complex hybrid industry of alternative energy systems. So you see that while your thesis might have taken much longer than you or most of your friends and supervisors ever thought, you delivered here perfectly timed a well-written thesis describing well the wider theoretical framework and presenting the evidence in a particularly convincing way. I also noted that your thesis is now the latest one in a pretty long list of dissertation series, I think I, I counted nearly 290, starting with the one of John Hagedorn back in 1988, in whom's tradition you carried out your research focusing on firms' external innovation strategies, such as mergers and acquisitions, licensing, joint ventures, etc. now over the full life cycle of the technology. So well done. The main question I would like to raise here is whether the analysis of the alternative energy system sector, which I particularly welcome given the small amount of research which has been carried out on innovation strategies in that sector as compared to semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, or other high-tech sectors, should not practically by definition also have to involve a fourth element next to the firm, the industry, and the technology life cycle. And that is, of course, the infrastructure aspect of this particular energy or clean energy system. And that infrastructure system or that infrastructure availability will often be crucial in retarding or enhancing the growth of alternative energy systems. As you highlight in the introductory chapter, the role of infrastructures has always been considered an essential factor in enabling systemic transformative change. And we see it, of course, today most dramatically in the various policy discussions on as you highlighted also, but also on the possible transport of hydrogen to fossil fuel gas pipelines, the issue about centralized versus decentralized energy storage and energy provision systems, both to the productive sector as well as to consumers, or even, as we heard more recently here in Europe at least, the replacement of the conventional fossil fuel 
petrol stations with electric car charging points alongside current petrol stations. And in a relatively short time, we're talking here about 2035. In all these cases, it seems that the large incumbent firms set the rules and leave very little room for new players. So how do you fit the, I would argue, the infrastructure part and the storage issue within your whole story? I look forward to, to your response. Uh, thank you, highly esteemed opponent, for the question. I, <laughs> you were talking about, if I can re-understand your question, but, uh, are you talking about the role of large firms? Or well, I, I would like to hear more about the infrastructural part next yeah. to your three elements, in which you analyzed the firm, the industry itself as being part of an emerging industry, and the particular product life cycle, as you highlighted in the case of these three technologies. But for me, the fourth sector, the underlying infrastructural distribution of mm -hmm. energy, is very different mm. in each of these areas. The firm is relying on an infrastructural system, which is often the state-owned, sometimes part of a particular firm, sometimes hybrid, etc. So how would you include the infrastructural elements in your analysis, given the focus on these three factors, uh, which for me are very insightful, but to some extent insufficient in this particular case? So I, I wouldn't, uh, since the analysis was on technology different stages, so I wouldn't look at an infrastructure at the fourth, right? So I would look as, as an enabler for the diffusion of these technologies in, in that sense, because we firstly we're looking at uh, the hydrogen fuel cell sector uh, applied to automobiles. So they need gas, these fuel, uh, fuel centers. And I think the infrastructure for each technology, other than solar and, and solar and wind, the infrastructures would differ from the hydrogen fuel cell. Um, so in terms of, I would see that in a way, the way I would see it is the infrastructure is developed by the government, right? And so once that's enabled, so that's why we would need more cooperations between the private sector and the government in that sense. Yeah. I don't know if I've answered it properly. You, you, do, you did an effort, but I would argue that your infrastructural part will be absolutely essential and will, of course, be a major advantage to incumbents who are sitting on an existing infrastructure, who can adapt mm -hmm. that infrastructure. Definitely. Think of the hydrogen use of the existing pipeline of gas as the method with a couple of technological changes which can be used to send hydrogen. Um, so in this sense, you really enter that is that the life cycle of the technology is being kept to some extent by the incumbents. You deal really with an, an enormous advantage of for incumbent firms who can then decide to retard the transfer to alternative energy systems because they still have a lot of oil or gas in the ground and still would like first to make profits out of those. So I would argue that the infrastructure adds an element of regulation. Of It could be, as you said, the public sector who invest in the infrastructure, but the public sector can also put in regulatory features, as in the case of 2035, limiting petrol, as say, fuel, fossil, fossil fuel petrol stations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Gold, uh, who is a professor at the uh, Tswana University of Technology in South Africa and who was also, um, whose area of expertise is in innovation and statistics, and who was also a member of the assessment committee. Professor Gold joins in from the internet, uh, and the floor goes uh, to him. Please unmute, please unmute, please unmute.
Dr. Gold, you are muted at the moment. Okay. If it doesn't work, we'll try Professor Gold later. And uh, I suggest that we uh, move on with uh, Dr. Doranova, whose area of expertise is in eco innovation and who was the third member of the assessment committee. The floor goes to Dr. Doranova. And later on, we'll try Professor Gold again. Uh uh, uh, Radical, uh, uh, congratulations on your thesis. Um, I've read it with a great interest, especially that I also deal with the very much policy-related issues with that. I've been working a lot with the, with the and especially that now that uh, the energy transition that we are trying to push uh, in Europe as well as in globally, uh, considering the current circumstances of uh, the, the war with Ukraine that our Big, big understanding is coming for the for the many uh, people, many policymakers, many companies, many citizens uh, about our inevitable need for ch shifting to the more alternative and sustainable and green uh, energy systems. Um, uh, I think these kind of theses are very, very important. Research, uh, the, the findings, the lessons are very, very important. Um, uh, it's important that they are coming. Um, considering the current uh, current situation and uh, mm, the the the, the po policymakers as well as the companies that they are looking into uh, solutions uh, for making this energy transition as as uh, quick and as uh, uh, swift as possible, um, with your thesis, with the knowledge that you have generated, uh, can you? Uh, give some uh, good takeaways, lessons, recommendations to to a to the policymakers, and uh, also what companies can also take away from the from 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 the research that you have generated. Maybe it, it can come from uh, from the insights that you got by studying it. Maybe it comes from the in-depth uh, like findings that you you have found it. So. Please be open to sharing like your your insights, your your takeaways for policymakers and for for the companies, for the industries. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, esteemed opponent, for the question. Yeah, um, when it comes to uh, policy learnings, especially for firms, it is for them to understand that they are, as I had spoken about in my f research as well on different sizes as well and different size firms bring in different res resources and different capabilities and it will also need to recognize that and then there are different resources skills flexibility in terms of the strategies that even the different lease or the firms use um, so and also for firms to understand that not always compete and we, we look towards collaboration bring in complementary skills, and also understand that the stage that the technology is in as well. And for the government policy, governments, it's important to understand the role that firms can play in fast tracking the transition towards uh, cleaner forms of technologies, and also to encourage and enable this interaction between industry and universities and public research organizations. And also by understanding which stage a technology is in, actually it allow the government to custom design specific policies that can address the issues and bottlenecks which are associated with that specific technology. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. The, we will try again whether the connection with Professor Gold uh, works this time uh, better than it did before. I introduced Professor Gold already. The floor goes to Professor Gold. Uh, you can try to mute, uh, to unmute, if that's possible. But it's no. from the system, right? Professor Gold, we from our side uh, at the moment, uh, we'll, we'll try you later on as the last opponent uh, so that it uh, provides sufficient time 
for technological or technical uh, uh, improvement of your connection with us. The, um, the, the, the opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Dr. Foster McGregor, who is a uh, professor in innovation and globalization uh, at the Maastricht University, in particular you knew Merritt, and he was, uh, he's an uh, additional opponent, uh, so the floor goes to Professor Foster McGregor. Thank you, Prorector. Um, dear candidate, dear Erika, um, let me also begin by joining in the congratulations on your thesis. I, I think it reads very nicely and it covers a lot of ground. And I think the thing I, I liked especially about it was the fact that it did to try to bring in all of these different literatures in thinking about the questions you were trying to address. So I, I found that very nice. And obviously, as already mentioned, the topic is obviously very timely given, given what's going on in the world at the moment, not just in Sharm el Sheikh, but also with energy crises and various other things that we were observing. <clears throat> so turning to my question, I have a question on chapter three, which looks at the, the sort of looks to relate the choice of innovation strategy to the stage of the technological life cycle, among other things, but that's the sort of main focus of, of the chapter. And the thing I like about this chapter, again, is, is the ambition. It's a very ambitious chapter, and I think maybe that sort of attempt to provide this big sweeping um, chapter, sort of you, you sometimes miss out on the details a little bit. So the, the first part of my question is actually something of a clarification question, trying to understand a little bit more uh, one or two of the things you were doing there, then I have a more substantive question at the end. So you indicate in the methodology that you use the different energy technologies, solar, wind, hydrogen cell technology, to identify the stages of the technological life cycle. Hydrogen being at, at the earliest stage, which is not, you're number one in your uh, empirical analysis, and wind the latest, number three. Hmm? But it's not so clear to me how this distinction was made. So as you, as you showed on your slides, in chapter one you report information on develops, developments in the number of patents, um, which could be one way of defining the stage of technological life cycle, but also in your chapter three and in the analytical framework that you developed, you talked about various other aspects. You talked about the role of firm size or number of firms. You talked about the science-based nature of technology. You talked about, in some cases, that the absence of market demand, the explorative stage is also relevant. So if I, if I read that well, then to define the life cycle, you need some kind of multidimensional measure. So I was wondering, as, as a sort of clarification, but also more generally to think, get your impression on this, is how did you define that technological life cycle to, to allocate solar, wind, hydrogen to these three stages? Um, and maybe in, in a better stage, state of the world, what, what data would you use to, to do that again in a different way, maybe? So that's a sort of, sort of the clarification type question. Um, the second part of my question relates again to, to the methodology in a sense, but in order to interpret your results on the technology life cycle variable in the way you do, then you need to assume that these three technologies impact on innovation strategy only through technology. Yeah, so all of the aspects, things like differences in policy in these different sectors, differences in regulations, standards, differences in openness to trade or something, are somehow assumed not to be relevant. And I wonder if, if that's a reasonable assumption um, and, and whether you need to think about to what extent these different, these different energy technologies actually capture differences in the technology life cycle versus something else, and, and how can you try and eliminate that, that if, those effects if they're present? So in, in essence, I'm asking to what extent might there, might there be biases in your results because you're not capturing technology life cycle, but you're capturing various other aspects of, the, of these particular energy technologies. Thank you, a highly esteemed opponent, for the question. And uh, I'll try and answer the first question first. Uh, as I remember, you asked it, um, how did I uh, determine the stages? Uh, the theory says that in the initial stages of uh, the industry, there are many firm entries. That was the other, uh, um, that was the other criteria in, in which I kind of understood that hydrogen fuel cells as compared to solar PV or wind, that it will fall under stage one. That was one of the ways. And uh, can I, can you please repeat the second question, please? The second question, the, the second question was with this idea that you, you essentially run a regression of um, a variable that takes the value one, two, three, depending upon which part of the life cycle you're in. And then you interpret the results on that as saying that um, 
this is due to the life cycle. But my point is that because this, 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 this variable, this one, two, three variable, is based upon sectors rather than actually information on the technological life cycle, mm -hmm. it could be that it's capturing other aspects. It could be that it's capturing something specific to the wind sector or the energy sector, related to standards, to openness, to various other things. And how can you eliminate the effects of that in order to conclude that it's actually the stage of a life cycle that's relevant and not some other confounding factor is essentially the question I'm asking. I wouldn't know really to answer that, but maybe it's more like an assumptions or already confounded factors that will prove because I, uh, yeah, I put them in stages. Like you're saying that it's already predetermined, right? And then I do the assess, uh, the analysis. And so it might not absorb the other factors which would be more relevant to the technology. I mean, yeah. Yeah, essentially, exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. it could be that there, there are certain other factors that might be driving that result. And is there any way to try and eliminate eliminate those other factors? That's the, yeah. yeah, I don't have the answer at the moment, sorry. Okay, thank you. The um, opposition will be continued by uh, uh, Dr. Um, Nomala. Dr. Nomala is uh, uh, connected to a master university, you knew Merit, and uh, he, uh, his, his area of expertise is in uh, uh, economics of innovation, and the floor goes to Dr. Nomala. Dear retirement, uh, let me also join congratulating you for your achievement. So just like most questions so far, I'm just going to focus on your chapter three. So what I see there is quite interesting and intriguing and a little bit confusing because of the very particular way you operationalize the idea of a technology life cycle. So because we are talking about three technologies, so it's not about the early stages, and the, the, the three stages of let's say fuel cells or alone or the, <clears throat> windmills or the PV, PV cells, but you are associating something with three different technologies. Um, so it's not really a technology life cycle, it's a, it's a sequence of technologies which might have different properties at the historically in terms of their own life cycle. So this is one. And the second peculiarity again is the industry because we are not talking about an industry that doesn't exist and is coming into existence. We are talking about a transition period that there is already an energy industry and what these new technologies represent is, is, a, is a shock to the system. So again, the question of what stages of the industry life cycle, these firms and these technologies find itself is not very clear to me. So I was wondering if you just could tell us a little bit about how generalizable this kind of an approach would be to some other transition system, for example, the emergence of the electrical vehicles. So how, how, how would you, again, that's given that it's also a transition system. So how would you then define the industry the, 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 the stage of the industry it's of it in its own life cycle and the technology is there. Would you again use a number of different competing technologies representing different styles? And of course, so, and of course, so in, in your answer, so it would be interesting if you just could use the example of Tesla because as we know, automotive industry has been has been vertically integrated but not that much even at its maturity whereas from day one the great success of tesla in introduction the introduction of electric vehicles have been due to is this you know incredible level of vertical integration thank you highly esteemed opponent for the question um uh, so ideally, actually, and I know that's a limitation of my research where I shouldn't be splitting the technologies into the stages, 
I would have liked, as I mentioned earlier uh, while presenting, that I would have preferred to have longitudinal data on each technology and then observe them over um, the entire duration from nascency to maturity. So that's a limitation, and at the time we collected the data, it was uh, not possible for us to do that. But if we just kind of, in a way, theorized around it, I would say, but I wouldn't really say it can be used as a general um, example to, yeah. But the assets and facets of uh, the framework can be used. Okay, then, then again, I mean, so, but given that, so could you, could you, could you just tell how, how, how would you approach the case of the electric vehicle industry? I would still um, consider uh, electric vehicles as uh, kind of emerging the nascent stage because of uh, because it's dependent on battery technologies and that is the issue it's still at nascencies globally when it comes to storage and battery technologies so in that sense it would still because it's still related in interlinked with another technology development, so I think it is, yeah. I would still say it'll, yeah. Okay, thank you. The uh, opposition will be continued by uh, Dr. Okay. Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang is uh, also connected as a guest professor at Dalian University of Technology in the People's Republic of China, but she's a senior researcher in economics of emerging technologies at uh, UNU Merit. The floor goes to Dr. Wang. Uh, thank you. Um, dear candidate, um, dear Radhika, um, first I also like to uh, congratulate you on finishing your thesis. It's a really very interesting one. Um, I enjoyed a lot reading it, and uh, uh, this, this thesis is very uh, nicely structured. Um, you have very nice uh, empirical analysis, and also you cover uh, lots of important topics uh, like uh, science, uh, technology, innovation, strategy, energy industry, all the important ones. Um, so um, uh, my question um, is mainly related to chapter five. So using uh, Web of Science publications, you try to analyze uh, the collaborative research between uh, firms and uh, universities and even research organizations. You find that the number of uh, partners with uh, uh, universities and the research organizations is higher uh, in the second stage of the technology life cycle than the earlier. And uh, you conclude uh, in, uh, in this book uh, that uh, firms should uh, work closely with universities and research organizations across all stages of uh, the uh, technology life cycle. Uh, so here, I am afraid I do not really quite understand uh, how you um, draw this conclusion. Uh, so uh, how exactly the industry and academic collaborations can influence the speed and the direction of technology, uh, technological changes. Um, so as far as I understand, there can, be, uh, there can be many different reasons for firms to work with universities or uh, research organizations. For, for instance, sometimes some firms like to show very advanced image to the, to the consumers. And so they like to publish, they like to, uh, to uh, conduct some academic research and to, to work with the universities. Uh, however, for this content, for this uh, energy industry or related technologies, I wonder, uh, 
to what extent is this kind of industry or academic uh, uh, collaboration can really help uh, with the technology life cycle. For instance, uh, can, um, can scientific research really help uh, uh, prolong the mature stage of the technology life cycle? Or oh, what's the reason for you to draw the conclusion to, to really uh, to encourage all the collaborations between uh, industry and academia? Thank you. Thank you, esteemed opponent, for the question. Um, if I can understand, like summarize your question, are you asking is how did I reach the conclusion that firms uh, collaborate more with universities and PROs than they do in the third stage. Yeah, so the, I, I did the uh, conclusions from the uh, data that I got, but the explanation would be, I think, uh, um, I can say that when you're in the third stage of the technology, it's more applied, it's more market-based, and so I, that's that's my conclusion, and um, th that's why the firms would do their R and D on their own, and they have they they would like to keep the designs that they have uh, rather than seek outside uh, assistance to help them. And I think when they are young, at the nascent or young stage of the technology, where it's very science-based and applied, and which the source, source of science-based uh, knowledge comes from universities, and that therefore uh, firms like to collaborate with universities for the for their knowledge base, and then so that's that's. that's uh, my if I may. Uh if I may continue a bit. Uh, because in your conclusion section, you especially emphasize that uh, um, the collaborations between universities and uh, be uh, between firms and the university and the research organizations should be encouraged across all stages, yeah. not only the earlier mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is about this. Yeah, OK. Uh, so one example is uh, Denmark. Uh, I think by 80s and 90s, they had already matured their wind turbine technology. But what they did and how it diffused also in other countries like India is that they started testing centers, and especially these testings and certification, cent uh, st uh, stand certification and testing standards for the industry standards of the technology. They were based in universities and research organizations. and. Uh, I think that's why I say that you know, they should collaborate across all the sectors, as, uh, all the stages as well. Thank you. Uh, let's, uh, the, the opposition will be continued, uh, hopefully, uh, by Professor uh, Gold, uh, whom I introduced already, and uh, whom, from his smile, we can deduce that he's connected now and does understand what we are saying, and we hopefully will fully understand what his question will be. The floor is yours, Professor Gold. Thank you very much. I hope people can hear me. Anyone hear me? Do I? Yes, you can hear me. Well, that's a good first step. <clears throat> I'm going to pose some simple questions, uh, which strike me as interesting. First, I congratulate the uh, candidate on the quality of the thesis. I think this is a significant contribution to our studies. We note that we've got the thesis is about firm innovation strategy. That tells us we're with the business sector. We understand where we are. Uh, this gives rise to two questions I would like to put. Could you tell us what innovation is? So think about that for a couple of seconds. That's the easy one. And then link innovation to the most successful strategy because you have gone through the thesis linking strategy to innovation. I would like you to take them apart and illuminate us on the question I'll pose yours. Thank you, highly esteemed opponent, for the question. 
um, that's the first thing that we learn when we come to uni merit. <laughs> and then by the end of the studies, mm -hmm. I think we forget how to define it. Um, I would say innovation is, uh, I would say all uh, innovation starts with creativity and uh, innovation is the implementation of the an idea. Put it in a single word. And yeah, and according to the textbooks, it's obviously something new, new to the industry, new to the uh, country, or new to uh, an application of another innovation in a new area, or yeah, so that's how I would explain an innovation. If you're not satisfied, then I can continue. Is that yeah. <clears throat> so you may want to exchange it. And that is linking innovation to the uh, successful strategy that you are discussing in the text. Please let me um, clarify the question. So you're asking what is, which according to me is a successful innovation or strategy? That, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that is close. Uh, linking the uh, innovation you are able to talk about and define uh, to the most successful strategy, to what strategies are making good use or effective use of innovation. I'd like to see how we connect one to the other. He, he, yeah, okay. If I understood your question correctly, it'll be, uh, I would always say that but the best innovation happens not in one place, it does not come from one mind. So we need to collaborate. And I think any collaborative strategy would be the best strategy, bringing in different sources, resources, and skills to make something work and happen. So if I got your question correctly. Uh, thank you. We, we can leave it at that point. The uh, opposition will be continued uh, once again by uh, Professor Dr. Sutte, if he uh, would like to. Uh, uh, otherwise, we can move on to other uh, opposers. The floor goes to Professor Sutte. Thank you. Thank you, Pro Rector. No, I would like to, to pursue a little bit the, also the issue which uh, Professor Gold just raised with respect to innovation and the measurement issues, as you have limited this here to, um, well, the, the information on the science, uh, the patent system, the licenses, the newspaper information on, on what you obtained in terms of various forms of acquisitions, joint ventures in an old tradition, as we know it since, uh, I would say, the work of John Hagedorn, Heer Duisters, etc., who have strongly influenced your work. The issue is, of course, and, and you referred to that in the introduction already, in your introduction, that of course, the research and development expenditures, which is a set of data which could, you could not get access to, um, is of course the one we would use more generally with respect to innovation indicators. Uh, it mm -hmm. is a little bit the old Frascati definitions which we have used. And of course, in this particular area, um, the fundamental question remains that you have this distinction between what you call alternative energy systems and let's put them fossil fuel or conventional energy systems. And of course, the, the, most of these firms will carry out research on both sides. So the problem uh, still in your data, which I would like to see you investigate much more and, and is to indicate to us to what extent the large conventional petrochemical firms are involved in alternative energy systems on the research side, but then prevent possibly the innovation because they are in sort of in a, in a game that they want to play for time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you saw this most clearly now with uh, the 
Ukrainian war that suddenly large Western oil companies were prepared to sell off, in Russia at least, their participations and their ownerships of these firms. And one would hope now would invest more fundamentally and more dramatically their research in terms of these alternative energy systems. So have you any idea on the distinction of the kind of traditional, conventional oil, gas, fossil fuel producing firms and firms more involved in highly specific alternative energy systems? What is the distribution in there, would you say? Um. I can't really remember, but I would say, as far as I can remember, it would be, um, especially in 1980s, uh, the first terrestrial PV solar plant was built by BP. So there are big players like Shell, BP, and other oil, and automobiles as well. But maybe I would say five to 10% in a way, yeah. But, but the large companies, yeah. Yeah, but as my colleague under Normaler, Dr. Normaler mentioned, uh, Tesla came completely outside uh, in the automobile industry. And so you see that you have incumbents which will stick to either in the energy sector fossil fuel, in the automobile sector the use in terms of combustion engines, and it's an outsider who comes in. And mm -hmm. I would like to hear more about your analysis of the firms, mm -hmm. 600 uh, firms mm -hmm. you have analyzed, in which areas were they distributed in terms of conventional existing firms or in terms of new emerging firms, specifically as you gave in the Danish example, uh, more in the specific new alternative energy systems? Yeah, uh, there would be more uh, large firms and the mature technology, actually. Uh, mature, like wind, wind, I don't know. But solar, definitely, but n uh, very less other than car companies in the hydrogen fuel cell sector. But mainly the breakthrough technologies come from the small firms. And then what the, what the whole um, discussion is that as, as maybe if, if ever hydrogen fuel cell matures, then maybe companies like Ballard, which, uh, which came up with a breakthrough hydrogen fuel cell um, technology in, uh, in, from Canada. So they would be um, maybe eat, merged with a larger company if a larger company has money to buy in the technology or something. But it's not happening in the early stages, definitely, because that's not where in interest is for the larger. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. The opposition may be continued by Dr. Uh, um, Doranova. If she still has a short question, then the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Possibly short question. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, short question. Um, I'm looking at your uh, thesis now. It looks like you are now uh, have shifted to a bit different area of research, right, at the moment, because I, I read it here that. Uh, your current research interest is in understanding the, what kind of leaders and organizations do we need to solve the, challenge, the challenges of the 21st century. How much is your, of your current research is uh, built on the, your existing, the, 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 this research that you've done, or if it's uh, detached, or uh, if you have any lessons from there that for your current, uh, from, from, from your previous research that you are using now, um, yeah, maybe you can elaborate on that. It's maybe a bit less related to the research thesis, but uh, about your current uh, research and how it connects to the old one. Thank you, Thank you uh, esteemed opponent, for the question. Um, yes, my PhD studies, that's right, and my PhD studies that did help me understand systems, how systems change, how it works, how it occurs, and what causes especially lock-ins, technological carbon lock-ins, and also understanding how it results. Yes, you may briefly conclude yes. your response, please. So yes, I use it because uh, systems change is brought in by, actually, by our thought processes. Uh, our thoughts create the systems we live in, and at, at the moment I'm working with people and leaders and organizations occupied by people and basically working at the level of the thought which gives rise to systems. So, in that sense. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Radhika Buyam, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed, and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defence. And I request that you and your company await the results of over deliberations and over return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare. Here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their change semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Camelot campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project that includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round but you get to use to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while.
Radhika Boyan, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense. And in view of its uh, positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Vospaget is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Veronica, I uh, still have to ask you one more question, uh, and I hope you're prepared for that. And the question is the following. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, which means to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. That was the correct answer. Thank you. Uh, in that case, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Radhika Bouillon, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by it by custom and law. And as evidence of that, I will now present you with the degree certificate, which is signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and which is affixed with the official seal of the university. Thank you. Law stays with Professor Fosbacher. Dear Radhika, I'm very happy to be here today. And as I recall, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong, this is actually the first time that we meet in real life. We've met a number of times online on various uh, systems, but in real life, this must probably be the first time, right? That's not right. You taught us for the coursework. Yes. Many years ago. <laughs> That's so long ago, yes. Uh, so, that's actually true, of course, which has actually paid off. So, this shows the fact that I forgot about that, the fact that I had thought that we'd mainly interacted online, that I came to this process relatively late. Uh, you've had already done a lot of the work that you have presented here and defended here today uh, a bit of time ago. Mm -hmm. And when I came to that a few years ago, the, the real reason that you were picking it up again is as you formulated in the acknowledgement in the thesis, the, the real reason is that you wanted to finish what you had started. And that had taken a little while. Uh, and then actually, when you approached me to do that, to finish what you had started, it lingered again for a little time, but then finally, exactly one year ago, a uh, few That's days, mm. but almost exactly one year ago, you really became determined to finish the job off. And there was an email which I managed to find, um, and that, that email actually is quite telling about all the struggles the reasons, perhaps why it took a bit of time, and so on. And I want to maybe uh, quote from that email a little bit. Um, the one thing that struck me, there were two things that struck me really about this email. The, the one thing was that you talked about, and here I quote, 
the difficult process of dealing with people and processes in academia. That can be true. We all know that indeed sometimes this can be very difficult. But in your case, I think it really represented the struggle that you had between, on the one hand, which is also in your email, a quotation where you say, we are collectively creating results that no one wants. But on the other hand, you also expressed that you wanted to really make an impact. And in that email, you told me about some of the plans that you had to make that impact. And you said, I need the degree to be able to do that. And that, in the end, gave you the determination exactly. to finish it. And I'm very happy that you did. And I'm very happy, in fact, that you also mentioned that reason, because at you and you merit, that's really all that we are concerned about. You and you merit is the place in academia, or is one of the places in academia, where we care about that particular impact. We do not want to do academics just for the, the processes and the people and the things that we can get out of that, but we want to do research to make an impact. And that's what you want to do, and that's why I think after all this time, we must conclude that you are a very good match to you and you merit, and you and you merit is a very good match to you uh, after all. So now you have the PhD. It's there. That's the evidence of all the hard work that you've done. Does that mean that your struggle is going to end? I don't think it will, <laughs> unfortunately, because if we look at what's going on in the world in terms of people who are doing academic research, who are making, trying to make an impact, then we can see how difficult this is. Because even in the UNU system, which is geared so much towards that impact, we can often see that that impact is difficult to achieve. Look at what Professor Suter mentioned, the COP, uh, topped at the climate conference now, there's a lot of things going on there, but will it ultimately have a real political impact in the world? Sometimes we wonder whether that's really the case. And that's going to be your reality as well. Even now that you have the PhD, you will still have to make that difference yourself. So it's up to you to whether that PhD, the work that you've put into, the things that you've learned, will in the end make a difference. I'm very confident that you will make that difference, and I hope that you will succeed. You. And I hope that then you will actually f never forget that this is what we here in you and you merit want to try to do every day, and that you are now definitely a part of. Thank you very much. Thanks Congratulations, <laughs> and good luck with your career. Thank you so much. Dr. Dear Dr. Buyan, also on behalf of Maastricht University, um, I congratulate you, um, your company, your supervisors, um, with the degree you have acquired. I would like to thank the members of the degree committee and uh, to give uh, both uh, opponents who were on the internet and now a very short opportunity uh, to extend their congratulations. Uh, to you, and that's both for Professor Gold and Dr. Nomala. Well, thank you for the opportunity to do this, and I do congratulate uh, our new doctor for philosophy, and I think we look forward to great things in the future. Uh, likewise, my congratulations. So I wish you all the best in life and your struggle to change the world. Okay. Thank you very much. Before closing uh, this session, I'd like to communicate that we will take pictures at the stairs, uh, etc. And then we will, of course, have an opportunity to congratulate you. Uh, personally here. With this, I close this academic session. Thank you.